Open your Bibles to James, chapter 5. James, chapter 5. Verse 10. We'll start at verse 10. Now, before I... I'm going to read verse 10 through... Verse 16. I'll have you write some words in the margin. But before I go there, I want to respond to a message that I received. And I really appreciate it because people are out there praying for me. People out there concerned for my health, well-being. And they're sending me, oh, I got all kinds of cures, remedies, suggestions over the last, over two years now. And I look at everyone serious. Most of them I already explored myself. I love that you're concerned for me. I love you for it. And I appreciate your concern. And just about every week, I get some kind of suggestion how this or that can improve my situation. A few days ago, I got this. In fact, it came in last Friday from a very faithful HOF. And once again, I want to express your dear concern for me that you took the time to even send this to me. But what you sent to me is going to be used as a teaching tool. How the Christian world has bewitched you in all sorts of topics. and why it's important to truly be a biblical detective to rightly divide the Word of God. I believe the Spirit does that. It leads people that are called to do it even though at times even I resist because I like the old thinking of the way I used to believe about certain scriptures. I've proven that in the last day series. But you know what? The last thing I want to do is stunt the spiritual growth because of my stubbornness. So I have to yield to my flesh constantly when correction is necessary. And the same has to go for you, my friend. This person wrote in a pretty good website. I'm not going to give the website. Not perfect, but none are. Well, I couldn't resist when I got this message and I went to the website. I wouldn't call it a pretty good website. First of all, it has different categories. Antichrist 666, totally left field. Christian science fiction. Baptism. Don't agree with it. Christmas. I'm not even... Easter. Don't, don't even have to go there. I think you know where I stand on that. And certain elements of the healing category in their website. I wouldn't even call this a good website. Definitely not a per pretty good website. You really need to read between the lines what they're preaching, friend. It might sound good in the service, but does it stand up against the test, test the test would be, does it stand up what scriptures are actually saying? Can it stand up to that? Or is this a man's opinion once again? Or ministry's opinion or the nomination's opinion. 
of what you should say because that's what has been said for centuries. Not perfect, but none are. No, I'm not saying any are perfect, to tell you the truth. But certain things, when it's wrong, it's wrong, my friend. And of course, it also had a link leading, leading to a healing for the sick. Exposition of how to get divine healing. So I went to it. I couldn't resist. Especially if it's going to another ministry. I could see, hey, may I miss something? When you're not feeling well, you'll try anything. So I couldn't resist and I went to it. And of course, it quotes Isaiah 53, 5. He was wounded for our transgression. He was booed for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And of course, most people think that leads to physical healing. It can, but that's not the main priority. And we can't find what that main priority was until we look at Peter in the New Testament. Looking back, then connecting the dots, we see that it was a spiritual healing, a spiritually disease that needed to be healed. You could be physically uh, ill and still get to see, see Jesus Christ in the eternal life future. But if you're spiritually diseased, guess what? You're not. Especially if you deny Jesus Christ. That's plain and simple. That's Christianity 101. So I knew that first verse, a common interpretation without connecting the dots, which I have. You've got to go back to the messages and see which ones. In fact, I need to have someone look that up, and I need to have our Canadian transcriber transcribe that message if we don't already have it. It's important to know my views on that, what I believe is coming from the Word of God. Then it goes on to saying, The prayer of, of faith shall save the sick. And it quotes James 5, 14 through 15. And the pr prayer of faith, I'll read it to King James, shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. And then it has a lot more things that, that's included in their, when I printed out the article. And it goes into things eventually of the law of binding and loosing and the law of remaining and contained, the law of God's presence, and this law and that law. And I'm going, oh my goodness. This thing gets further out there in left field. And then it finishes off with some scriptures on healing, which I really don't have that much against because some of them are spot on. But the thing is, for the most part, it was a useless waste of time. And I'm used to that. But it's unfortunate that many will be sucked into this way of thinking that this is what the rightly divided Word of God says. So let's read the verses first. I'll start with verse 10. Take my brethren the prophets, I'm in James 5 verse 10. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for example of suffering affliction. Now you, you guys should know that by now, what that means. And of patience, I just preached on this verse, behold, we count them happy of which endure, or to be patient on them. Remember that? I just preached that not too long ago. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, our brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be a yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any among you 
dealing with cockapateo, hardships, afflictions. Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Of course, our first tendency is to think of physical sickness. Let him call or invite, a better translation, the elders of the church, and let him pray or supplicate over him, anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. You know what? I thought about this many times. Why can I not be healed? If my faith is not strong enough, I have many people out there praying for me. Many. Let's say it just would take two to make the right connecting prayer to Jesus to receive my healing if my faith was too weak. Just think about it, folks. If I was to, were to take the view of most of Christi Christianity concerning these verses, you are all lousy prayers. You're lousy prayer warriors with lousy prayers. I'm not trying to insult you. I'm trying to prove a point, which you'll understand as this evening progresses forward. I mean, God's not listening to you. Jesus is not listening to you. I need to find new prayer warriors. Because even if my faith was weak, you should be there to back me up and God should be listening to you. If that's what this verse means. And the prayer of faith shall say the sick and the Lord shall raise him up and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. What does that have to do with sickness? Confess your faults. Now, the first thing I want you to write in, it's not confess. Bad translation. Acknowledge your faults, and you'll see why when I get to it later in the program. Or acknowledge your, literally, side slips in the Greek. Your side slips that lead you to fall away. Not fall away because of sickness, but falling away. So what does that have to do with verse 15? How do we get to verse 16 like that? How do we get from verse 14 to verse 15 like that? Changing the subject matter of the whole letter. <coughs> and only dealing that with sickness for one verse. Possibly two. This verse. So acknowledge your side slips one to another. Pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent or the act of efficient, should be a better translation, petition of a righteous man or one that's right with God, literally, availeth much or has force. Has force. I'm sure there's some Christian out there, well, you haven't confessed your faults, whatever those sins are, and that's why you're still sick. If that's what this verse said, I would agree with you. But it's the furthest thing from the truth what this verse is saying. I have told you many times, and this is where I get so animated, when people twist the word of God. either for their lack of ability to be able to understand it, or they're not chosen to communicate in the first place. Whatever the cause, it aggravates me that when they take scriptures and twist it. We have to remember, this is a letter that was written. So you just can't scripture pick. What you want to pick from the scriptures to create an agenda or a belief system, what you think these scriptures are saying. That's private interpretation, which, which scriptures warns, you, warns against. Don't get involved in those things. 
It's fallen on deaf ears. It's fallen on deaf ears. You got to remember the whole context of this letter, the overall context of this letter. If you haven't read it, read it. Throughout this letter, starting with the first chapter and ending with verse 20 in the fifth chapter, James addressing people whose faith came under fire, my friend. The readers of this letter, the ones that receive it, were struggling to remain faithful. in the face of persecution. And sometimes even persecution from rich unbelievers. Yes, that's in this letter. And then we see in this letter, if you know how to read between the lines, that there's evidence in this letter to these people that many readers are responding in a wrong fashion. And that's what this letter addresses. It's a very misunderstood letter, a letter that's developed a lot of contra controversy. If you read between the lines, he's writing to people that are quarreling, fighting, seeking positions of power and influence, all in this little letter. And you see that from the very first verse up to this point in these two verses. And then a sudden change, and then it changes again. Isn't that kind of odd? A statement right in the towards the end of this letter about how to recover if you've become physically ill it really breaks the flow of thought when reading the whole letter in its context James throughout this letter is telling his readers to remain stay steadfast, excuse me, in the faith. And the flow of that is continuous. And like I said, it just doesn't fit that the flow would be broken for two verses or a very long sentence or two in the Greek and then get right back to the flow again. It's almost, James had a, oh, by the way, thought. Let me include this in the letter, too. This letter, especially at this portion of the letter, is dealing with people who find themselves weak in the faith. Not people that are physically sick. Now, with that little bit of an introduction, and I'll get back to the verses, I want to read you something. Because we're trying to figure out, do these verses, verse 14 and 15, mean physically ill or weak and weary? Write that down. Does it mean physically ill or weak and weary? There's not that many people that take the point of view that I'll present to you tonight. But there's a few, and I'll read some of their work. Concerning verses 13 through 16, Christian's experience has not been one of assured healing in response to prayers of faith. 
suggesting that something must be wrong with the view in James 5, 13 through 16. Because like I said, if that's the case, most of the church world, the last 2,000 years, have had lousy prayer warriors. You think about it. Doesn't it say, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick? Then how come more sick are not being saved from their physical illness? How come? The only logical conclusion to that is they're lousy prayer warriors that don't know how to pray or supplicate. Do I believe that? Absolutely not. But if I would believe what they're preaching, then I would have to question it myself also. Christian experience has not been one of assured healing in response to prayers of faith, suggesting that something must be wrong with that view. To deal with the difficulty, various groups of Christians have understood the passage in at least six different ways. Oh, great, more confusion. They include the Roman Catholic view, the hyper or ultra disp dispensational view, the charismatic Pentecostal view, the liberal Protestant naturalistic view, a literal plain meaning view, or a figurative or spiritual view. I'll read to you quickly because I'm going to run out of time, but I'll read you some of the views. The Roman Catholic view in verse 16 is a proof text for the sacrament of confession. <laughs> verse 14 is a proof text for extreme unction, extreme in that it is the last anointing. A priest prays and anoints with holy oil, thereby providing spiritual benefit. Oil is created from a special recipe and a special ceremony. Ooh, some magic potion. The parts of the body anointed include eyes, ears, nose, mouth, lower back, and navel. The anointing allegedly equips the recipient to do battle with the forces of darkness and death. Note that the Roman Catholic view diverges greatly from the intent of the text. The meaning is not to prepare the soul for death, but if you would take the normal Christian point of view, but to restore a sick person to life. I contend you could be physically sick, but you also could be spiritually sick. But I'll get to that. The hyper-ultra-dispensational view. Now, there is a name, catchy name, huh? Ultra-dispensationalists believe the church as we know it today began with the conversion of Paul. James is thereby regulated, along with the Gospels, to an earlier dispensation. <laughs> That's probably a real weak view there, without much substance, but let's, let's go further. The charismatic Pentecostal view, view. This is essentially the view of modern-day faith leaders. They see James 5, 13 through 16 as reflecting a dis dis distinct ordinance of healing that is sacred and binding as any other ordinance of the Gospel. If there is a problem in fulfilling the passage promise of healing, it has to do with the lack of faith. I repeat, lack of faith on, say, I'm the one that's sick. On my part? But if you're going to go that far, a lack of faith on your part also, because I should be able to be healed by your faith. The way they understand these scriptures... Noted the added burden this places on a sick person who is not healed in response to prayer. Not only is this person still sick, but he or she is also deficient in faith. Thus the sickness is transformed into just punishment for lack of faith. That's the charismatic Pentecostal view. The liberal Protestant naturalistic, naturalistic view. It reads, this view discounts, discounts any supernatural miraculous influence and preference for healing through the power of suggestion. Others see the oil as therapeutic in itself, as was commonly believed and practiced in the ancient world. And I believe that. And in fact, it's a fact. But I don't believe it's what it's, it says in these scriptures any longer. I haven't for a while. I used to believe that. And I've told you many times. I'm a work in progress. And once searching the scriptures proves differently... I'm not ashamed of changing my point of view if I believe it's now the rightly divided, corrected point of view on the subject matter. 
I think I've proven that. Others have too much ego to even consider it. And yes, there was a practice in New Testament early history days, not just in the Christian world, but in the world in general, that you use all types of different oils as a medicine, and you would rub these certain oils in different parts or the whole part of your body to see if it could create a sense of wellness so you could turn the corner and be healed of whatever you were being afflicted of. Others see the oil as therapeutic in itself and it was commonly believed and practiced in the ancient world. The oil based on the Greek word used here appears to be olive oil. An objection is that oil can't be treatment for every ailment. Also, why couldn't it be used by someone other than the elders? Even non-Christians? Even non-Christians? Why prayer? According to James, the promise of healing is not based on oil, but on faith. Yeah, why go through the practice of rubbing the oil on if it was based on faith? Good question. Let's go to the literal plain meaning view. This view takes the face value meaning of anointing and praying for the physically sick. It's similar to the charismatic view, but non-supernatural. But non and of course, the last view, the figurative spiritual view. This view sees the sickness as spiritual. The underlying Greek word astineno is used literally five times in Matthew, once in Mark, four times in Luke, eight times in John, seven times in Acts, once in 2 Corinthians, and twice in Philippians, and once in 2 Timothy. It's not always literal, however. And it goes on to use, given a whole bunch of different figurative uses with that particular word, in which I'm not going to get, get into because I don't want this to go along to the night's program, but let me continue. The Greek word kamo, for instance, in verse 15, can be understood as sick, but is also understood as weary or faint-hearted. So, in our King James, the word after shall save the sick. That word there, sick, can also mean weary or faint-hearted. The meaning of camo depends upon how one understands astineno, the word for sick. Note that the initiative appears to be upon the weak, one to gather the elders. Also, if restoration is not in view, why elders? Why elders? If physical sickness is in view, why wouldn't the elders come without being called? If spiritual sickness is in view, though, then the reason is clear. Spiritual sickness is more apt to be known to the one afflicted, not so much with physical illness. Also, if physical sickness is a circumstance, why not just one elder? Why not just anyone? Why not just any healer? Note that the person in verse 13 prays for himself or herself or the person in 14 calls others to pray for him. Let's go back and read it. Yes, verse 13 in the King James. How's it read? Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. It didn't say let them pray. It says let him pray. Note the person of verse 13 prays for himself or herself, while the person of verse 14 calls others to pray for him or her. Also, the ones called are leaders of the local congregation, another argument for spiritual sickness and restora restoration. The prayer of faith, not a prayer of faith, may refer to a special prayer. If he has committed sins, leaves open the possibility that sickness may not be due to sins. If so, the spiritual problems could be due to weak conscience, the weaker brother or sister. A compelling case can be made that the passage in question is talking about spiritual restoration, with Greek astonato referring to spiritual weakness, not physical sickness. Moreover, the anointing would be symbolic, the same as baptism and the Lord's Supper have their symbolism. Oil would be to, oil would be to the spiritual restoration of James 5, 13 and 16. As, a, as bread is to the Lord's Supper, just as the bread of the Lord's Supper has nothing to do with physical nourishment, so also would the oil of the anointing in James have nothing to do with physical healing. 
Both would be symbolic or sacramental. Verse 16 does not transition to spiritual sickness. Rather, it would appear to clarify the real focus of verse 13 through 15 as spiritual sickness. James would be saying something akin to John along the lines of, if we confess our sins, God is faithful to forgive our sins. That, that is the kind of situation where divine healing is guaranteed. If so, then James 5, 13 through 15 most likely deals with the restoration of people to Christian fellowship, not the healing of physical diseases. The whole scenario being worked out with the context of the local church. Okay, let's look at someone else's view. I won't read as much because I'm running out of time, but I'll read enough. There has been various ideas about the meaning of this passage. Some of its words are used in more than one way in the Bible. And their meaning must be determined by the context. There are some religious groups which engage in healing services today and use oil to anoint the sick to produce a miracle. They appeal to this passage as their reason for doing so. Of course, an assembly of the whole church is not being discussed here at all. Among our brethren, some agree that this passage deals with miraculous healing of the physical sick, but add that the age of miracles has passed, and therefore so has this particular procedure. That's their argument, because people are not getting healed. Others agree that the passage deals with physical sickness, but not miraculous healing. <laughs> the idea is that the elders pray for the sick and apply oil for his med medicinal effect, then the Lord responds to prayers of faith by providing for natural recovery. While the Lord is directly involved, he uses natural processes instead of superseding laws of nature to bring about healing. Then there are those that contend that the passage is not discussing physical sickness at all, which is I'm part of that group, not all that other nonsense I just read to you. But rather spiritual sickness. As we read our English translations, one will first think of physical illness. So from where do these folks get this idea of spiritual sickness from? Back to reading the verses, and I'll use the translation here. Is anyone suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone among you sick? The, the prayer offering of faith will restore the one who is sick. Looking at how these words are used in other passages will help us narrow down this, their possible meanings as used here. And that's what I've said for anyone to do for many, many years. Become biblical detectives, folks. Take Stop taking scriptures and make it your own private interpretation to fill your promise box. Suffering, for instance. Everyone that listens to me is familiar with the word kakapateo. Suffer, hardship, endured affliction. That's right. Of the four times this verb is used in the New Testament, it's always used with a reference to hardships that come as a result of being a Christian. Paul told Timothy to suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And later in the same chapter said, For which I suffer hardships, kakapateo, even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not in prison. We have covered those passages many times. Sick or astaneo. To be sick is one translation. Weak is another one. Be in need is is another one. This word occurs 36 times in the New Testament. In the, gospel, in the Gospels, it's always referred to physical sickness. And that's true. However, in the epistles, it's at least, at least eight of the times it is, used, it is used and refers not to physical sickness, but rather spiritual sickness. And without becoming weak in faith, for in instance, for what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh. Another example. We wouldn't say, for the law could not do in that it was sick through the flesh. It was weak through the flesh. And without becoming weak in the, sick in the faith, no, it's weak in the faith. Another example in Romans, 
But take care lest the liberty of yours somehow become a stumbling block, not to the sick, to the weak. But same word in the Greek. So then it must be determined by the context which sickness or weakness is meant. Physical or spiritual? Let him pray, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. These instructions are given to those who are suffering, sick, and who may also sin in their weakness. As we have already seen, this suffering affliction is hardship brought on by our faith. The pressures mount as trials come, persecutions rears its ugly head, Loss is suffered, and one begins to feel as if he's slipping. That's why I told you to write down the translation for false in verse 16, which literally means side slip, falling away. It comes from a root word that means falling away. You're side slipping. He wonders why this is happening to him. Is God concerned at all? He considers giving up. He needs help. First, he is told to pray. James has already dealt with what kind of prayer should be offered in trial if one is to endure. Of course, you find that in James chapter 1, verse 2 through 8. Second, he's told to call for the elders of the church. It was not a requirement that elders of the first century have the gift of miraculous healing. Nor was it a requirement that they be skilled in treating the physically sick with, the good, with good doctoring. But it was a requirement that they have qualities that would allow them to protect, guard, and feed their flock, including the spiritual weak. You go to 1 Timothy and also Titus. You see the qualifications of elders there. And one of the qualifications is not being able to heal. You didn't have to be a healer healer to be a elder that was not one of the qualifications but a qualification was able to teach and exhort you go to the book of acts you see the responsibility of the elders same thing in thessalonians and back to Th timothy it was about spiritual care friend and guidance the requirement was not that you'd be able to physically heal people This would explain the meaning of anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord to be figurative. As it is in Psalms 23.5 and Hebrews 1.9. You can write those down and check it out yourself. But what does it symbolize here? What would be spiritual medicine used to anoint the spiritually sick? Consult the great physician. Jesus used the words of truth to bring about spiritual healing. The medicine needed when a brother or sister is weak in faith is to anoint them with the oil of words of encouragement and exhortation. I don't know if I can find it quickly enough. Let me see if I can. If not, I'll move on, but I want to see if I can find it first. I know it's in Luke. Hang on, folks. Yes, Luke chapter 5. Don't go there, just write it down. This is Jesus. And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician. This is when the... Uh, well, I'll just read the previous verses. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house, and, three were, and, and there was a great company of publicans and of the others that sat down with them. But their, but their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Christ was not talking about a physical sickness there. He was talking about a spiritual sickness. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners 
to repentance or sinners to have a change of mind. So I understand what this individual is saying. Jesus used the words of truth to bring spiritual healing. The medicine needed when a brother or sister is weak in faith is to anoint them with the oil of words of encouragement and exhortation, to remind them the promise of God and his dealings with others in similar situations in the past, like Job and the prophets, which James in verse 7 and 8 in the same chapter referred to. These kind of words and prayers of faith are exactly what the doctor ordered. Third, he is to confess his sins. I make a correction there. He is to acknowledge his sins. Again, the assembly in a public confession is not in this passage. Neither is making the confession to a clergyman who will absolve you of your sins. It is done so prayers of faith can be offered and help can be rendered. The results will restore such a one who is spiritually sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, they will be forgiving him, forgiven him so that you may be healed, or they healed. This action will have the effect of strengthening one who is weak and tired. It is the Lord's method to raise a stumbling brother or sister up and to renew their vigor. It is accomplished by the power of his gospel. It is to be done in the spirit of gentleness. We are the strongest as a body when we share concern for the weak. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. Make straight paths for your feet, so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. That's Hebrews 12, verse 12 and 13. It is not necessary that, so that one will sin when he is weak, but certainly there is more of a risk falling than there is when we are strong. What about the times when a brother or sister also have sinned? Perhaps because of doubt or fear, they have not been, they have not been what they should have been. The answer? Confess or acknowledge and pray for one another and if he has committed sins they will be forgiven him so that you may be healed you're not confessing your sins to someone else so they can forgive you you're conf acknowledging your sins as you're praying with your brethren who are there to strengthen you and Christ will do the forgiving if you side slip Christ will do the forgiving and get you on the path and why wouldn't he? His blood's still covering. His blood is still removing your sins. But if your conscience has brought you down where you seem like you can't pick yourself up, you need that brethren there to strengthen you to say, hey, Christ already died for you and spilled his blood. Get with it. In your own words, of course. Mine will be different than yours. Get on your feet. You still have that blood covering. Your sins are still removed. Now get on the path of faith and start trusting have confidence in Jesus Christ once again and He will spiritually heal you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. As an example, brethren of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and merciful. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that the one who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The context plainly shows that it is spiritual trials and suffering, spiritual weakness, sin, and being saved from such is under consideration here. Disciples of James' day were being put to the test. The epistles mention several forms this pressure was taken. It is times such as these that we need the Lord's help more than ever. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. That's what these scriptures are saying. Is anyone sick? In context, is anyone weary or faint-hearted? Because the trials of your faith somehow brought you to the point where you're not faithing and you're side-slipping. If that's where you find yourself, let him call for the elders of the church. Why do you think I why do you 
Why do you think I always ask you, what are your prayer needs? I want to be constantly praying for you. I tell you my physical problem enough to the point where I think I maybe aggravate some of you with the same news, it seems like, every time. That's because I've not been healed yet. But that's physical sickness. But that's not what this is saying. Call for the oath of the church and let them supplicate over him with words of encouragement. And the prayer of faith shall save the weary, literally. And the Lord shall raise them up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven. If he is sideslip, Jesus is still in the forgiving business, my friend. His blood hasn't changed. It's not less effective now than it was 2,000 years ago. Acknowledge your faults or your sideslips that cause you to fall away one to another and pray for another that ye may be healed from that slide slip. The effective, the active and efficient, literally, prayer or petition of the one that's right with God has force, literally. It's powerful. Why would you not want to share your needs with me? I'll keep them private if you tell me to. Believe me, I tell people around me all the time what I need them to pray for. Some of you are hermits in the prayer world. I don't know why, maybe because you're embarrassed or because you want nobody to know maybe how bad you think you are. Let me tell you something right now. Nothing's new under the sun, my friend. That's why Paul said he was the chief of sinners. He knew what he was. And he knew what he could slip into. That's why he constantly was asking for prayer. There is force in us uniting, helping each other. Why not take advantage of it? I also believe that in physical sickness. But those verses are not these verses are not dealing with physical sickness. It's dealing with spiritual sickness. So anybody who teaches this on physical sickness is taking the Word of God out of context, especially this letter, which has a whole different purpose in dealing with the weary, the ones that are becoming faint-hearted or grumbling about the struggles of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And I'll finish with verse 20 because I'm running out of time. Let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide or cover up a multitude of sins. Bring them back to Jesus. Getting their heads screwed on straight once again about the power that's in the blood. Believe me, God's not going to fall off your throne because of your sins. He'll keep you from the throne if you don't come to Him. And the principle of the church is there's assistance. There's help in numbers. We are to petition together. Not only privately, that's what verse 13 was about, but also as a group of united disciples of Jesus Christ. To be active and efficient because we're right with God and we know that carries a heck of a punch. There's force behind it to restore anyone that sideslips, anyone that became spiritual disease once again and needs a spiritual healing. 
That's what these scriptures are talking about. And back to how I started. I appreciate all the concern and love for my physical problem. But I'm going to use, and I did use, this email as a teaching moment, so to speak, to finally come out what I've known for a while now, that these verses, because one of the things that led me to searching out these scriptures is my own problem of physical sickness. I wanted to find out what is real and what is not real by what I've heard or what I've learned in the past concerning that topic. I've never had the opportunity with you to share it with you yet. Well, this email, and thank God for your emails, created that opportunity and I took the time to express to you what the context of this verse means. This is a message that also needs to be transcribed. So you can review it, because I went fairly quickly, because I wanted to conclude it in only one message tonight. So you can review it and apply the proper meaning so you can rightly divide the word of God. You got it? Now if you do, play a song I want to hear from you. <laughs> 